Hello, CASW members. Welcome. In Ottawa, we're having a very snowy, beautiful day. Uh, I am so excited to be tucked away in my little office space here with you and with an incredible webinar presenter. I know I tend to say that a lot, but this time I'm actually very, 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 very <laughs> excited for the presentation that we have. Uh, we are going to dive into children's rights and the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. We have, like I had said, an incredible webinar presenter, and I am so excited excited to dive in. Before I dive in though quickly, as everyone knows, we're gonna do a couple little housekeeping notes. And if you're new, welcome. I'm so excited you're here. Our platform is really amazing. So let's take about two seconds and run through all the different features and functions that you can use while you're on our platform so that you can get the best experience and viewing experience you have today. So I'm Alexandra. I am the social policy coordinator uh, and communications coordinator here at the CISW. So we do all of our continuing webinars and continuing education together. Take a note that your screen is completely customizable. So if you wanted to make the slides bigger, if you wanted to make our faces bigger or smaller, whatever you want to do, take some time and really make sure that the platform works for you and for your learning style. There should also be a question box. Please feel free to type your questions at any point in the presentation. We do have a little bit of an interactive presentation. We have some polls. Uh, and then we'll, we will have about 10 minutes at the end for some questions. So if there's a question that pops up in your head, don't worry about waiting till the end. Just type it, and I will make sure I add it to a list for us to ask our presenter at the end. Uh, there is also a certificate. If you want a certificate of completion, you have to stay with us for about 40 minutes. That should not be a problem. This webinar is going to be very interesting. Uh, after about 40 minutes, just click the yellow uh, certificate sign at the bottom and that will be able to give you your certificate if you need it. Always you can be in touch with us though however if you do have any questions about that. That should be it. Like I said, make sure you engage with the platform, play around with it a little bit, see what works best for you, uh, and make sure you type your questions throughout the whole presentation. Uh, so today our webinar is on, like I had said, children's rights. We are joined by the founder and CEO of Children First Canada. Um, so Sarah, Sarah Austin is the founder and CEO of Children First Canada. Canada. Sarah is a world-class champion for children with more than 20 years of global and Canadian experience. As the founder and CEO of Children First Canada, she leads a national movement to make Canada the best place in the world for kids to grow up. She holds an MST and an LLM with distinction in international human rights law from Oxford and an honors BA in international development and women's studies from Dalhousie University. She has completed the governance Essentials Program for Nonprofits with the Institute of Corporate Directors, the Maytree Foundation's Public Policy Program, and the University of Alberta's Indigenous Partnership Program. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. It's great to be here. We are going yeah, we're going to get in here. We're going to dive right in. But as we sometimes do with these presentations, we love to know where our social workers are coming from, what they do. Uh, I have tried to condense it into a small poll question. However, we know that as social workers, you're, you often span many sectors. So let's see if we can try and uh, try and get this poll question for what most best represents your day to day practice. Uh, so take a look at the poll we have going right now. I'll give you a couple minutes to answer that. And of course, if it's other, please give us a use the question and answer box to type what other means. We would love to know what you mean by other if you don't fit into the kind of small categories we have tried to lay out. I'll give you a couple more seconds here. All right, let's see what we got. Awesome. So it looks like we've got child protection, children and youth, medical public health. Like I said, please, other, let us know what it is. The second question, child advocate, amazing, welcome. We're so excited to have you. Second poll question here, gonna be quick. What, what part of the country do you work in? We wanna know. First Nations Child and Family Work, amazing, welcome. We are going to be diving into some incredible topics for everyone, it seems. Let's see where everyone's from. Oh, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, New Brunswick, great, okay. 
All right, well, with that, I am going to pass it over to Sarah. Sarah, welcome. Uh, we're so excited to have your presentation. Take it away. Great, well, thank you. I'm really thrilled to be joining you from uh, Calgary, Alberta and Treaty 7 territory and really appreciate the invitation to be a part of this presentation today and to uh, be talking about something that I'm really passionate about, which is the rights of Canada's kids. So some of you may be hearing about Children First Canada for the very first time. We are a relatively new organization. We're going on our fifth anniversary this year. And it's really, um, you know, came about because of the need for uh, a strong, independent voice for Canada's kids. As all of you know, there are lots of organizations serving and supporting kids across this country and frontline services, uh, but we really saw a gap when it came to being um, an you know, advocate for Canada's lack of awareness, lack of policy influence. And so Children First was really founded with this bold and ambitious vision that together we can make Canada the best in the world for kids to grow up. And we have a very long way to go, as you can see from the slide here. Uh, Canada is currently ranked 25th out of 41 wealthy nations for the well-being of children. And uh, so we're going to dive into that more. Where, what are the rights of children? Where do we currently rank? Where do we, where do we think we can go? And how can we help us get there? So this presentation will start with just an overview of children's rights. Uh, what are children's rights? What is, what is the use of the children's framework, uh, and what is Canada really committed to do to advance the rights and well-being of our children. Uh, then we'll talk about where Canada currently measures up, where, where do we rank when it comes to other countries for the well-being of our children, and what are some real gaps around the, the rights of kids in Canada. And lastly, we'll talk about what will it take to really move the needle for Canada. Uh, so starting out with what, what are children's rights and what is Canada committed to do. Well, some of you may have heard of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. This is uh, one of the most uh, widely endorsed and uh, inclusive uh, human rights treaties of all time. It's a really powerful tool that enshrines the rights of children as human rights holders, uh, and it extends some of the human rights that previously existed for, for adults to children, but it also provides really unique rights that are specific. And I think something that's also really powerful about the Convention on the Rights of the Child is that challenges our unthinking assumptions about children, about children as, um, as being sort of small, mini human beings with mini rights, um, and um, this idea of children are property of adults, and that, uh, that they're just simply objects of our charity. It really enshrines the sense that children are human beings with their own human rights, um, and provides unique rights to children that they need not only to survive, but thrive on life. So the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child was first um, adopted by the UN General Assembly in November of 1989. The process and up to this at a moment started a long time before that. The treaty entered into force in 1990. And so this past um, November uh, for National Child Day, we celebrated the 30th anniversary of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And as I said, it's one of the most widely human rights um, uh, widely endorsed human rights treaties of all time, uh, ratified by virtually every country in the world, and uh, and widely understood and respected, um, but still a long way to go when it comes to full implementation. Um, there have been several attempts um, in terms of trying to really galvanize global attention to the rights of children. Um, two notable uh, global summits: 1990 World Summit for Children, Canada co-chaired with the government of Mali, which was the important. Uh, forum to really put children's rights on the agenda. And then a, um, another uh, important forum was in 2002 when the UN General Assembly hosted the UN Children, and we'll come back to that in a little bit more later. So often when we hear about children's rights, uh, people tend to think of this as being a relatively new concept, but it's important to know that there's a long standing history of recognizing this progressive realization of kids rights and its protection of law. Uh, the first time it was children's rights were formally recognized back in 1924. It came about during the context of World War I, um, and um, the founder of an organization called Save Children drafted the UN Declaration on the Rights of Children that was adopted by the League of Nations at the time. And it was the first time that children's rights were really being recognized in law and where there was 
medical attention to the need to recognize children as citizens with specific rights. Uh, but of course, uh, the world shortly thereafter experienced World War II and really significant violations of human rights. And that led to the UN adopting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And in the context of that, there was also the need to more formally recognize uh, children's rights. And with the transition of the League of Nations to the United Nations, uh, the Declaration of the Child was subsequently adopted. Uh, but as a declaration, it still it was, you know, in legal terms, sort of a softer legal, not being formally legally binding, and more of a principle. And so, um, you know, you see over time the gradual um, strengthening of legal tools to protect children's rights. And it was in 1979 that the international community declared uh, the year of the child, and again, where there was international attention being paid kids and um, celebration of children as, as being special members of our society, but also to really move the needle for protection of children's rights in law and in practice. Uh, we send, saw the development of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which was finally adopted in 1989, but with a process to close to 30 about and I mean it speaks to the fact that while there's recognition that children are special members of society, right, that they are often considered quite controversial. Uh, concepts of children as being um, uh, having entitlement to their own rights and um, being not seen as property of adults and, and having rights, unique rights, whether it's uh, protection from from all forms of violence to uh, protection of privacy rights. Some of these things can often be considered certain controversial from a cultural perspective. So as I mentioned earlier, there was the UN World Summit in 1990, which helped to galvanize global attention, um, and subsequently the adoption of several other human rights to protect children's rights. Uh, there are three optimal protocols at the DRC. The protocol for the involvement of children in armed conflict, um, optional protocol on the sale of children, child and child pornography, both past 2000. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the, the World Summit for Children in 2002, and subsequently the adoption of the UN Optional Protocol. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. So Canada's role in all of this has been for a long time been seen as a, a world leader for the of children's rights, and in many cases has really helped to champion the, uh, the passing option of several of these protocols. Uh, so Canada celebrated the Year of the Child with the League Negotiator and the creation of the UN's um, When Canada ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child, we named National Day of the Child, which is November 20th, which is now for close to three years. Um, and has been played a key role in negotiating many of these other documents and hosting several of these. Um, aside from adopting several of the international treaties, it's important to note that in 2007, Canada also adopted its own unique um, human rights um, protocol, specifically relating to the rights of uh, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit children. Um, the protocol term is Jordan's, Jordan's Principle, which really enshrines the rights of Indigenous children to um, have access to resources that are equitable and really enshrine the need for governments to set aside red tape and to avoid getting caught in jurisdictional battles, particularly when it comes to paying the bills of children, of Indigenous children's access to services, and uh, really provides the right that whoever is the, the government agency um, providing that service needs to pay the bill and uh, that the red tape needs to be worked out behind the scenes, that children's access to services should not be delayed because of um, jurisdictional disputes over funding. And one other important point here is that Canada also was a lead negotiator in the adoption of the International Day of the Girls' Circles, which is celebrated now. So coming to some of the key concepts of children's rights, you know, as I was talking about earlier, it really recognizes children as human beings, persons, and not just being many people, but actually being human beings that have their own rights. It also recognizes children as being juvenile. They're young people, but they still have a measure of autonomy and, and, and some rights around decisions that are made about the life. The CRC also recognizes children as future adults. 
um, that they are um, growing and developing skills and cognitive abilities, um, and not that they have uh, inherent value for not only who they be in the future, but also who they are to the children as um, human beings today are uh, special human beings. But we don't. We often talk about children and in investing in uh, our future, but when you talk about children's rights, it's important to talk about investing who they are today and their value to this is right now. So when you think about child rights as a framework, it's important to think about, you know, what difference is it and why is it so important to think about a right framework as opposed to simply taking a more traditional approach, approach to uh, addressing the needs of children. You know, one of the really important concepts that children's rights brings about is the, um, the need to look at um, the overall context, the social, economic, uh, cultural, and civil and political context in which kids live, and that this Rather than just simply meeting basic needs, we need to have a policy framework in place and to look at children's rights in, in the broad context. Children's rights are something called indivisible. So you can't just take a single right and promote it unto itself. You have to think about the implications for a wide range of rights and how they are. When you think about a needs framework, it's often very focused on the outcome, right? ensuring that a child is fed or ensuring that they have access in school. Um, whereas rights-based approach really brings in a, um, more of a look at the process. So rather than simply feeding a child, how, what is, are, are they treated with dignity with how, um, how they have access to um, healthy, nutritious food? Or um, is there, uh, uh, are they involved in some of the decisions that affect their lives? So it's not simply just meeting that basic need, but it's how that need is met. And that it involves building of capacity um, people for meeting those needs, but also of children themselves. Um, I think another important concept that comes across here is the need um, to uh, recognize the obligations, particularly of duty, what we call duty bearer and, and the government in particular. That this is not just an act of charity uh, to children that actually have the obligations that we need to fulfill for children both on the part of government, but all adults, you know, members of society have all whether they be parents or service providers like social workers, uh, teachers, and other members of our community. And um, and I think it's something else that comes across really here is that, again, children are not simply acts of our charity, that they have um, they have rights based in law um, and that these are inherent to being a human. Uh, there are a number of other concepts that come out here. In the interest of time, I'll just over these, but um, but I think again, there's some really important shifts that happen when you transition from a needs-based framework to a rights-based framework. That's really much more empowering, um, and that really sees children within a, a complex setting, and that we need to be um, recognizing them uh, as human beings with rights. And I think just one of the last ones to highlight here is this universality. Uh, we're not just trying to meet the needs of um, some kids; we're trying to address. The, the rights of every child. Um, in Canada, we have nearly eight million kids in our country, and it's not good enough that um, you know that a certain number of them are free from issues, from abuse, or have access to education. We need to make sure that every single child in Canada is um, is experiencing the full enjoyment of rights. So, the Convention on the Rights of the Child is a fairly lengthy document. We won't go through that today, but. Uh, you know, when it, we're trying to bring this to life, it's important to find ways to, you know, in ways that not only we adults can understand, but that kids can understand. Too. So we have Children First Canada created a child version of the CRC, um, and I'll provide the link to that later in the presentation. Um, it really lays it out on a much more simplified version for children to understand, but also simplifies it for adults. So there. While it's a very lengthy document with a whole long list of rights for children, the easiest way to think about the one CR is to, to group it in clusters of children's rights. And there are different ways of clustering them, but the most common way to recognize them is the three P protect them, uh, provision, and participation. So the protection um, are ones that many of you would be most familiar with, you know, protect them from, from forms of violence and abuse. Uh, Provision rights are more related to provision of basic um, adequate nutrition, provision of education, um, 
And the participation rights is probably um, one of the less known, but um, equally important forms of children's rights, which is the right of children to be in the decisions that affect their lives. And that, that that's done in a way that's appropriate for their um, stage of development, their cognitive abilities. And there's several guiding principles that come out from the UN and the CRC that are also important, some of which you would be very familiar with in the context of social work. First one being non-discrimination, that child has the right to services and care and support, um, and they not be discriminated against on any basis of gender, um, age, um, or uh, ethnic uh, um, religious status anyway. There's no reason why we should be discriminating against kids and we need to ensure equitable. Of course, another very basic concept that all of my, I think all of you would be familiar with is the best interest of the child. Even pe for people who've never heard about children's rights before would probably have heard about the best interest principle because, um, you know, I think it's something as a society we generally can get our head around that we all should be asking for the best interest of children. But this is probably one of the hardest to implement because um, what, what I might think of the best interest of the child and what you might think or what a child might think might be very different. And so it's really important to think about best interests within the context of these other um, guiding principles. Um, and particularly when it comes to the participating children in deciding uh, what is in their best interest and negotiating um, that in the context of very complex rights around their survival and the ability to thrive in life. Of course, another guiding principle here is that children have the right to not only to, to live and survive, but to develop. And so we need to ensure their survival, um, but also with them with the access to the services and to, uh, to thrive and to achieve their potential. And I've already talked about the participation rights, the right to be heard uh, in all settings, whether it's in the family and be involved in family decisions, in school setting, around the uh, the rules and regulations of the school, um, but even in curriculum development. But also, I think one of the uh, less um, understood participation is around the involvement of kids in, in decision making and the policies that are set, whether it's the laws or um, our budget decisions that are made at municipal, provincial, or federal levels, but also in how our organizations are run. Those of us serving as a kids on a day to day basis, how are we involving them into the decisions? And how do we know that we're we're meeting their needs if we're not involving them in like, planning our programs to serve and support them, resources are allocated, but also not only in planning and executing, but in evaluating and providing receiving. Sorry, Sarah. Yes. Sorry to interrupt you. We're having a bit of a chop. It's a little bit choppy right now. Are you able to potentially refresh your, your page? Your audio is a little bit choppy. Okay. So everyone, give us one minute. Sarah's going to refresh your page. Hopefully that will help. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Um, so better. carrying on, one of the really important concepts that comes out with children's rights is this idea of rights holders. Obviously, kids are the rights holders, but um, that they... Um, that they not only have rights, they also have some responsibilities to um, around claiming those rights, participating in, in realizing those rights. But um, a, a corresponding duty that comes with that is the obligation of duty bearers, you know, primary duty bearers being the government who has enshrined these rights in law, but also uh, adults and particularly parents as primary duty bearers as um, having the, the primary duty to ensure the survival and protection of their children but also the, the duty of, of, of government to intervene if parents are failing to meet those needs, uh, but also the duties of other members of society, be they teachers, social workers, uh, but also members of society, whether they be aunties and uncles and neighbors, as well as um, you know, other actors of society like um, the private sector and their obligations to ensure the protection of children's rights in the quality of um, services and supports that they provide uh, through the private sector. And of course, the role of civil society organizations, be they faith-based institutions or secular organizations, we all have duties as adults towards children. So I mentioned earlier that there was this UN um, Summit for Children in 2002. It was a really a galvanizing moment for the international community around protecting children's rights. It was the very first time in history that children had the opportunity to address the UN General Assembly uh, and where they attended this 
forum as full delegates. Um, it was a really powerful opportunity where children had been engaged in national and regional forums. So it wasn't just this one day event. Kids had been involved for the process of several years, um, working with their peers in their countries and regions, and ultimately leading up to this UN summit where the uh, international community adopted a document called a World Fit for Children, and where the kids adopted their own document called a World Fit for Us. And what was really important that came out of that was not only had the international community set global goals, it also created an obligation for governments to, uh, to create plans of action to implement that within the national context. Um, and so following that global summit, Canada had developed something called a Canada Fit for Children that was based on those global goals. And Canada's um, national plan of action was really focused around four major areas, supporting families and um, strengthening communities, promoting healthy lives, uh, protecting children from harm, and promoting education and learning. This is, took a lot of consultation involving the federal and provincial and territorial governments, civil society, and kids themselves. It was a really powerful plan of action that was created for kids. And yet, um, as often as the case, when you experience a change of government, as we did in 2006, Six. Sadly, that national plan of action was set aside, and uh, and as we'll come back to shortly, um, sadly we lost a significant um, national momentum in Canada around implementing the rights of children, and um, and really creating accountability for the federal and provincial governments to move forward. I've already talked about the other optional protocols um, around the sale of children in armed conflict. Something to note, um, because Canada has ratified those two other human rights treaties, um, the third optional protocol, which allows children to file complaints against their governments when their rights were denied. I, I developed that protocol and led the global campaign to bring it into force. Um, but sadly, Canada was one of the staunchest adversaries around the creation of this protocol. Canada fought it uh, at the United Nations and, um, and to this day has not yet ratified this treaty. Um, and some of you may have heard about it in the news, but uh, Greta and 15 of her peers have now filed complaints against their governments related to rights, the rights to survival and a healthy development, uh, particularly around climate change and um, the obligations of governments to support the rights of kids to survive and thrive. So that sort of speaks to the power of a tool like this for children to be heard by their governments, but also by the international community, and where we would hope that um, Canada will swiftly take action to sign this protocol and give kids in our own country the right to hold our government accountable. Um, there are several ways in which um, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child can be used to really help um, promote children's rights. Of course, it affects laws and, and policy making. The government should be passing, every time they pass a law, should be thinking about its impact on the rights of children, but also doing historical look back and seeing what laws have previously been passed before Canada adopted the CRC and what legal reform is required. But continuing to look at our, our laws through the eyes of children's rights and ensuring that they're protected. Um, child rights budgeting is a really important concept, looking at how municipal, uh, provincial and federal governments spend their resources are kids getting their fair share of resources? And is that money going towards um, the protection of children's rights uh, and to evidence-based policies that would really improve the lives of the kids? I've spoken about national plans of action like a Canada Fit for Children. Sadly, Canada does not currently have a plan of action to promote children's rights. And has we've seen real um, uh, a backward slide around the protection of kids' rights over the past decade. There are mechanisms to monitor children's rights, including um, mechanisms like the provincial uh, child advocates offices that we have uh, but to date Canada does not yet have a national monitoring mechanism and where children first and many other child advocates have long advocated for um, a federal children's commissioner whose ma primary mandate would be around promotion of children's rights and ensuring accountability. Of course another important measure is around child rights education, awareness raising and training. Sadly uh, you know 30 years pa past adopting the CRC most Canadians have never heard of the treaty, and in particular, many children are not learning their rights. Um, you know, our experience with Children First is that when we host a forum, an event, a program, that children are coming to our to our programs and learning about their rights for the very first time. Uh, these are kids who have grown up in Canada and going to schools and never learning about their rights, and um, and um, are really desperately trying to find ways and support to be able to promote their rights in schools um, and, and be a part of the realization of their rights. Uh, but of course, we also need to raise awareness of parents and other members of society, just like we're doing here today, talking about rights and how they can be a powerful tool for change. Um, and 
know, the, again, we need the, to have human rights institutions promoting children's rights, and we need to all be working together. It can't be government alone doing this. It can't be simply civil society. We're all in this together, and we need to have these efforts coordinated and have mechanisms that support that. Uh, I think, you know, looking at, you know, at the field of social work, some of the rights that are most important in the in your domain of work would be, of course, be the protection rights, uh, whether they are around protection from abuse and violence, um, children um, who are deprived of a family environment, rights around adoption, rights of specific groups of children, like refugee children or ki kids who experience uh, child labor, um, you know, a range of other topics. So that, you know, the, the Convention on the Rights of the Child is often just thought of this very broad kind of concept. And yet, when you drill down into it, there are very specific rights on a whole host of issues um, that pertain directly to the work you folks do day in and day out, serving and supporting kids. Um, uh, some of the specific rights around abuse, uh, uh, in particular, are drawn from Articles 19 and 34 that talk about different forms of abuse um, and the specific rights that kids have in that context, and the responsibilities both of parents as well as government. Um, something that's also really important in the Convention on the Rights of the Child is this concept of cruel and degrading punishment of children. Um, as we know here in Canada, the concept of um, uh, uh, physical punishment of children is still very controversial, uh, heavily embedded in um, cultural and religious norms, uh, but where, at least when it comes to international law, there is a very clear perspective on this, that uh, children have the right to protection from all forms of violence, including spanking, um, and, and but not only physical punishment, but also other forms of degrading punishment, be they, um, you know, de dehumanizing children with uh, through through verbal abuse or other forms of uh, of abuse that are d diminishing to the integrity um, and, and inherent um, rights of a child. Um, I've talked about this earlier, but the participation rights, again, are probably one of the more um, uh, novel concepts that came out in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, that it's, it's not just us as adults doing things for kids, the kids themselves have something to say, uh, even very young children. Um, and we often underestimate the ability of children, um, particularly young children, to have, a, have a, something meaningful to say. Uh, and, but the, the, the Convention on the Rights of the Child does not set an age limit at which children can express themselves and be involved in decisions. It talks about this in this idea of um, their evolving capacity and uh, the right of every child to, to participate. Um, and of course, it's based on in accordance with their age and maturity. But the obligation is on us as adults, we are parents or service providers like social workers, to be doing our due diligence to be uh, providing opportunities for kids to participate in age appropriate ways whether it's in family decision-making, the judicial administrative procedures, or all the way up to policy-making and setting the laws that affect their children's lives. So turning now to the concept of, you know, where does Canada measure up? Um, and, you know, we tend to think of ourselves in many ways in Canada as being world leaders for a whole host of things, from democracy to human rights to our prosperity. But when it comes to the rights and well-being of our children, Canada is sadly not a world leader. Uh, so Canada currently ranks 25th amongst 41 wealthy nations, um, OECD countries for the well-being of children and the protection of their rights. Um, you know, we obviously fall behind um, some of the, the usual suspects in Scandinavia, but also fall behind other countries like uh, Spain, Estonia, Portugal, uh, Czech Republic, Poland, Italy, um, countries where we would think, uh, given our, our you know, robust um, um, human rights systems, but also our um, robust healthcare system and our educational system, systems that we typically pride ourselves on, are not serving our kids in the way that we would expect them to, and where we have a long way to go to really measure up. Uh, some of the reasons why Canada falls behind are because of some really stark statistics around the health and safety of our children. Uh, our very high uh, infant mortality rates, infant mortality, particularly for kids in the north, is on par with sub-Saharan Africa. Um, high teen suicide rates, uh, teen drunkenness, teen births, uh, poverty rates, as we know in Canada, have been uh, radically high. Uh, we're gradually seeing some progress in recent years, but still very high rates of poverty that are setting us behind, uh, that not only impact kids today, but for, for decades to come in terms of their health outcomes. Uh, but also a range of other health outcomes that relate to kids around their food security, healthy weight, breastfeeding, uh, child homicide rates, and bullying. 
Um, Children First Canada has done some further studies around the health and well-being of kids. I won't go into the studies now. If you're interested, um, you can download copies of the reports on our website. But uh, this report is, is called Raising Canada. We started publishing it in 2018, looking at the health and well-being of Canada's kids. Um, and uh, it's had a really radical result in truly trying to raise awareness of Canadians around the health and safety of kids. And one of the really important things that's come out of this is busting this myth around what it's like to grow up in Canada. There are 8 million kids in Canada, but our studies have shown that fully one-third of Canada's kids do not enjoy a safe and healthy childhood. And the statistics are really deeply disturbing around kids, uh, the high rates of infant mortality, uh, the high rates of suicide. The leading causes of death in kids for kids in Canada are, are preventable injuries followed by um, suicide, which is obviously deeply disturbing. But we're also seeing high increases in uh, visits to emergency rooms because of mental health concerns. Um, high rates of obesity um, because of lack of adequate nutrition and lack of physical activity. You know, we can go on and on with these deeply disturbing statistics. I think one of the most upsetting, for, for particularly for, um, for those of you in the, on this call today, is, is the high rates of child abuse in Canada. Only one third of Canada's kids have experienced some form of abuse before the age of 16. So the Raising Canada report has really helped to put these issues on the public radar um, and really trying to build the business case for action. We did a follow-up report that, that did um, the economic analysis. What is the cost of maintaining the status quo? And when it comes to child abuse, it costs Canadians an estimated $23 billion a year in terms of providing the care and support to help children heal from trauma, uh, but also the long-term outcome to the physical, their ability to be productive in the workplace and, um, and the long ongoing impacts to their health. Um, we costed out obesity. $22 billion a year and bullying at $4 billion a year. There is a high economic cost to be paid for maintaining the status quo. And we're, we're not, clearly there's a moral imperative for action, but we're also trying to make it easier for government and for the private sector to make investments in the health and well-being of our kids. The report has had an outstanding um, uh, response. The first year alone, we had a ton of media coverage. The report was picked up by the Senate of Canada. They convened a special caucus to hear about our report. All the federal agencies and the and the and the government can do a special session with us and with our youth ambassadors. We held special sessions with kids um, and a summits to involve them as well as business leaders. Um, and there was a ton of media coverage that year. We did a follow-up report in 2019 and really looking at um, the context of uh, children's rights and putting their issues on the radar in the federal election. We released the 2019 report in September of last year, just as we were heading into the federal election, provided a toolkit to get Canadians talking about what matters to our kids and the importance of protecting their rights. And we held events in Calgary and Toronto and a national campaign with a ton of media coverage, uh, lots of social media engagement, and engaging, of course, the political leaders. We, um, we, were, um, we were really trying to keep kids' issues on the radar throughout the federal election and campaigning to, to really hold our federal government accountable. You can see and you'll get copies of all these slides later, but where we've had great resources on our website for Canadians who were you know, having MPs coming knocking on your door um, or uh, as you went to the polls ultimately to help you decide where each of the parties stand. And we had a platform analysis of where each of the political parties stood on the top 10 threats to Canada's kids and provided you know, an unbiased perspective on where what they had committed to do and uh, and where we now will be holding the parties accountable. And we had this little um, toolkit to help Canadians as they prepared to vote with some key questions that they could be asking candidates around the rights of our children and asking Canadians to really think about what would happen if kids could vote and what difference would it make if we all voted on behalf of Canada. Uh, we've done a lot of work and really around trying to engage kids in decision making that affects their lives, particularly at the federal level, engaging kids in forums with um, with members of parliament, uh, but particularly with the cabinet, members of cabinet um, and key ministers. Uh, we've held special sessions where kids have had the opportunity to meet with our minister of finance and uh, a special event on Parliament Hill where, uh, where, where children were interviewed by members of parliament and where kids you know, we, kids were able to turn the tables on on the MPs and ask them really tough questions about what they were prepared to do to really move the needle for kids' rights in Canada. Um, this year is a really important year because um, Canada is currently being reviewed by the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. Uh, as, a, as Canada has ratified this treaty, every government who has ratified the treaty gets reviewed every five years, and Canada's review is happening right now. Canada submitted their government report um, last year in 2019, 
And now is the time for civil society to be providing our perspective. I know the, the view of those of us working on the ground, serving as the party kids. What do we think is really happening in the lives of children? So Children First is submitting a report to the UN with participation of children and helping write that report. Um, and civil society groups across the country are writing reports as well. Um, and I've included some of the timelines here. It's an important time for us all to be thinking about how do we hold our government accountable to what they've promoted and, and obligated themselves to do. And um, for those of you who are interested in learning more about the process, we've got a link there to, uh, to the UN, sorry, to the uh, Canadian Coalition for Children's Rights, uh, which is helping to coordinate that reporting process. So what will it take to move the needle? Well, clearly we have a long way to go to make Canada a world leading country for kids and to protect their rights. And in our view, um, you know, we have, um, it can often feel like quite daunting to think about Canada being ranked 25th to becoming a world leading country for kids. But if you look at the UK, um, they have, uh, they have, they have been able to do just that. Um, they Back in um, 2007, uh, they were ranked uh, very high for, um, they had really poor rankings for children's well-being, um, but they implemented some really important policy measures to improve the, the, uh, the well-being of kids in their country and protect their rights, and where they have moved from 21st place to being 13th place in the world for children. Meantime, uh, Canada was, was ranked 12th and is currently ranked 25th. So we have been heading in the wrong direction for the past decade. And where, as an organization that advocates for kids, you know, we really think it's time to urgently um, turn the tide for Kansas children. One of the problems is most Canadians don't know that there's a problem. We've done public polling on this a couple of times. And sadly, only 3% of Canadians are aware of the harsh reality where we currently rank. Um, so it's hard to solve a problem that Canadians don't know exists. So part of the problem that we have is just simply convincing Canadians and raising awareness and busting myths about childhood in Canada. But the good news is that when Canadians actually learn where we rank, so when we share that we're ranked 25th, that an overwhelming 91% of Canadians believe that Canada should put a high priority on improving children's rights and their well-being and making it a high priority. So we have strong public support. So it's um, while we do, while Canadians largely aren't aware, when they become aware, they support the need for action, and that's important to really build the public pressure and the political will for action. We have this idea that kids are 25% of our population, but they are 100% of our future, and so we need to be investing in kids today, not only because they are in, have inherent uh, rights and well-being, but because the future of our country depends on it. And, uh, and I think that's something all of you work, uh, understand and appreciate in the context of your work every day. We have three calls to action. You know, we want to see a federal commission for children and youth, somebody independent in government whose primary mandate is to promote the rights of kids, to hear directly from kids, and to work with those of us who are on the front lines, um, to hear from us and to work together to really hold our government accountable. We want to see a, a pan-Canadian strategy for kids um, going back to the, the document, the Canada Fit for Children, seeing uh, what's possible when the federal government works with the provinces and territories and those of us on the front lines and kids themselves to really set some bold and ambitious goals and hold ourselves accountable to it. And lastly, we want to see a children's budget. We want to know what our government is spending on our kids to see if they're getting their fair share and where is that money going and how can it really make a difference um, to move the needle for children. So what role could each of you play? Well, of course, you know, within the context of your work, it's really important that you embed the concept of children's rights in your um, in your day-to-day -day work and how you um, how you engage directly with children themselves, um, whether it's in the direct service provision that you have with them, uh, and and helping uh, children and how you treat children and recognizing them as human rights holders, but also helping them to uh, helping and raising awareness, helping children to learn about their rights and to. Uh, promote that concept and involve them in participating in the individual decisions that affect their lives, but also in how your organizations are run, the programs you serve, you execute and involving them in evaluating you and, and the programs that you're running. Uh, you know, we have this concept and this well-known concept that it takes a village to raise a child, but, you know, in my view, it really takes a nation to raise a nation. It's going to take every single one of us, parents, um, community members, um, service providers, and our government working together to really move the needle for kids. And it's important to think of the nation in this because, um, because many of the policies that our kids depend on are driven um, 
either by the provinces or by our federal government, that they have legal duties to promote our, the rights of kids. And, uh, and so it's really important that they play their role in this too. Um, so some individual and collective action that we can all take is first of all, engaging directly with our federal leaders, urging our prime minister, the minister of finance and the minister for family, children and social development to support the three calls to action. Uh, you can engage with them on social media, uh, tag them um, and invite them to, uh, to support uh, action around the top 10 threats to Canada's kids. There's, of course, opportunities to engage your local MP, uh, whether it's calling their office or sending them an email or paying their office a visit, but um, and inviting them to come to your organization, to come and meet with, with you, but also meet with kids in your programs or in um, kids who are receiving your services. Uh, you know, it's not often that, kids, that MPs get to engage with kids outside of the day you know, the, the barbecues or the photo ops, uh, to be engaged with kids in, in really meaningful discussions around um, the, the obligations of our members of parliament to serve and support the rights of children. So any opportunity you can engage with your MP and, and invite them to engage with kids, it's really important. Of course, there's an important role that you can all play as ambassadors for children's rights, promoting the rights of children, sharing information and uh, engaging with your friends, family, colleagues, and inviting them to call on the PM and our members of parliament to take action. Of course, staying engaged and informed of these issues. I know all of you are doing ongoing professional development in the context of your work, but staying informed particularly around the rights of children and the opportunities for action. So you, know, you can go to our website, sign up for our newsletter, and that's an opportunity to stay abreast of, of meet, you know, upcoming opportunities around action for children's rights. And of course, involving kids themselves, teaching them their rights, uh, sharing with them the Raising Canada report, inviting them to be heard and providing them with support. Uh, you know, kids have such creative ways of sharing their ideas. Uh, when we had that election campaign last year, you know, kids were creating social media videos, they were creating campaign posters and finding really powerful ways for them to articulate themselves and to be heard in the federal election. But there's opportunities like that day in and day out through the course of our work. Uh, and through the work that each of you do um, every day. Um, we have our next Raising Canada report coming up this fall to, to be released in September. We'll be doing events across the country, but uh, ongoing social media promotion to really promote the rights of Canada's kids and really to move the needle uh, around the health and well-being of the children. Um, clearly, I think you all know this, um, Canadians care about our kids. You know, they believe that our kids deserve the best opportunities in life. There's a strong business case for action that um, uh, we know that investing in kids today is, is the best thing for them, not only today, but for our future and, and where we've done the research that there. Um, a dollar invested in the early years of life reaps uh, big dividends and saves um, $9 in future spending on health care and other social services. Um, you know, our kids depend on us, but we depend on them too. And so it's in everybody's best interest to be promoting the rights of our children and ensuring that they can achieve their potential. Uh, on our website, childrenfirstcanada.org, uh, we have lots of resources about children's rights. Uh, you can um, access the poster, um, uh, the children's rights uh, in child-friendly language. Um, and we're happy, to, right now, you can normally post, order one poster for uh, $10, but we'll, uh, for anyone who orders posters as a result of the seminar, we'll uh, give you 10 copies for the price of one. Um, so that we can really encourage you to share those child rights posters in your workplaces and schools and other places where you're serving and supporting kids. We've got some great t-shirts, we've got the report that you can download for free and other resources around how to promote the rights of kids. And of course, National Child Day comes up in November, November 20th. So we have the nationalchildday.org website where you can learn more about National Child Day and how you can celebrate that um, in your workplace or in the organizations where you serve and support kids. Um, and there's links here to more information about our website and our social media where you can follow along and be engaged. So that brings me to the end of the presentation and I'm really eager to hear your questions and comments and, um, and engage with you. Thank you so much. Amazing. Yeah, we have about 10 minutes. So please, I, we did have some incredible uh, questions come in during the presentation. If you do, however, have some questions, type them in right now. Like I said, we have about 10 minutes. So that should be enough time to really dig into it. Uh, something throughout my mind the whole time listening to this presentation was just how much social workers do belong at the policy and advocacy tables. Um, 
we oftentimes are very entrenched in our work, which is so important on the ground. But Sarah really gave us an incredible opportunity to reflect on how important it is for us to also advocate and engage in policy and engage with our members in par of parliament. Um, and Sarah also gave us amazing avenues to do that with this review that's going on uh, and with all the work that you're doing. So please, as social workers who are experts in child welfare, <laughs> engage with your policymakers and, and, and really take to heart what was said. So. Some of the questions that we have, we got some some really good ones. Uh, one of them is talking about, you had mentioned the uh, Canada Child Benefit and some of the Canada Child Tax Benefits. Uh, a lot of social workers do end up working with some individuals who are uh, working with people on reserve, uh, some people who aren't qualifying for the Canada Child Benefit. Um, I'm wondering if you're able to speak to some of the uh, the issues of not being able to be eligible for the Canada Child Benefit, and if you believe the Canada Child Benefit has done a lot in helping um, with children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a challenging question. I, I don't know that I can speak uh, specifically about the, the issues of um, eligibility and qualification, um, but I'd be happy to, um, to get back to you and, and we can share some feedback, maybe uh, find a way to, a mechanism to share that back to the participants today. I'm happy to take that away around, I mean, what difference is it making? And certainly our government is making a lot of noise about what they see as the progress it's making. Um, Stats Canada just came out with new data earlier this week um, that we're still working our way through around uh, what the government say, sees in terms of um, lifting children out of poverty and reducing the numbers of uh, children and all Canadians out of poverty. That's obviously been quite controversial uh, because um, you know, the child, um, people working to serve and support kids across the country are, are seeing quite a different picture. Um, and and even just the measure for, for child poverty that the government is using versus uh, the measures that many child advocates would use are different. And so there's an ongoing dialogue around how do we measure poverty and what are the right indicators for that. Um, but, you know, what we are hearing through Children First Canada, through the direct organizations that serve and support kids day in and day out is that while the data and Stats Canada may be improving, that the lived experience is not. Uh, that uh, wait lists are up uh, through the yin. I live in the city of Calgary, but I know this is true for many other cities across Canada, that wait lists for after school programs or for mental health supports or for a whole host of other things are skyrocketing. And that mm -hmm. uh, frontline agencies cannot keep up with the demand. And so while on paper, we may be seeing measurable increases in kids being lifted out of poverty, that the lived experience is quite different. And um, and so we are going to continue to have that discussion with government, but of course, with all of you working directly with kids, how do we how do we close this gap between what's what's what we see on paper and what we see in reality and the lived experience of children? Because we know that every day matters in the life of a child, but it's what it's like for them to go to school hungry, to not have a full belly in school, uh, to go home and not be you know, not have adequate nutrition, or to not have adequate housing, or even clean water in some cases. Uh, but that's in a, um, in, well, that's uh, it's just it's completely unacceptable in a country as wealthy as ours, and that we need to be advocating boldly for our children, uh, even if we have seen measures um, increasing and kids being lifted out of poverty uh, in the way that the government demonstrates, we still have far too many kids left behind and we need to, we can't rest on our laurels and say that that's good enough. Yeah, incredible. Yeah, I, we, we always advocate for a, a very multi-ministerial and comprehensive, comprehensive approach to reducing poverty or ending poverty in Canada. Uh, so the CCB is part of that, but I mean, we require childcare, housing, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a lot of spaces. So thank you, Sarah. Uh, a really good question. And I mean, this might be tough. This must be, might be a tough one too. Uh, so I'm here, I'm here to help you dig into it as well. But <laughs> we, have, uh, we have some, we have some, some individuals wondering about advocacy efforts in terms of the rights of the child being implemented into child welfare systems. Um, I know oftentimes we have best interests of the child, et cetera, et cetera, but we, I don't know if we necessarily have the rights of the child implemented and embedded within the child welfare system. Um, so I'm wondering if you could speak to what maybe that would look like to implement the rights of the child into the child welfare system. <laughs> that is a very big question. Um, you know, I have direct experience having worked um, with child um, 
children's aid societies and um, child advocacy centers that support children with, um, who are victims of abuse, um, that I, my observation would be that our child welfare systems are, are not, do not currently embed um, child, our child rights framework and that there is a long way to go to really reform that um, uh, for a whole host of reasons, but um, that there is a, a I think one of the avenues into changes through the role of the provincial uh, child and youth advocates who uh, generally have um, a statutory obligation to promote the rights of children and to uh, to use a child rights framework within the context of their work. And so I think the, um, while the systems largely do, are, are, have huge gaps around the protection of children's rights, that the, the role of provincial child advocates where they exist are a really powerful tool to help advance the rights of children, but also increasing the, the knowledge and competencies of the service providers within child welfare agencies to advance the rights of children. Um, but as we all know, that these uh, the systems in which they're established are very significant across the country from one province to the next. The child welfare systems are very different and that they're, uh, in many cases, not serving and supporting the rights of our children in the way that they need to. I mean, another another opportunity is is being individual advocates. So if you are working in child protection and you are working within the child welfare system, why don't you get a poster and, and put it up in your in your office space or, or start talking about what it could look like to implement the rights of the child within your practice? As we know, um, it's provincial and every child welfare organization does things a little bit differently. So, you know, you can individually look into different ways to implement um, the convention within your own workplace. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So that I, think that's, I think that's so important. I mean, it can feel really daunting to think about these huge systems that are really hard to change and whether, um, whether it's the legislation in which they're established or the cultural systems in which they operate, uh, political or whatever, um, that we ourselves each are powerful advocates for children and the individual kids that we advocate with, but also in our colleagues and how we interact with them. And so you are ambassadors of children's rights. And so you need to think about yourselves and the powerful role that you have your voice and the impact that you can have on the, the kids you serve, but also the colleagues that you work with. Yeah, exactly. Uh, just a, like a quick non <laughs> difficult question. I have someone asking about ordering posters. Can you let them know exactly how they could do that? Yes, if you go to childrenfirstcanada.org, um, we have a section called shop and you can go on the, the shop website, uh, shop section, and you can order the posters there. They're also available on the national child day dot or website, um, but if you order posters this week, the, uh, normally you just buy one for $10, but we'll give you 10 copies for the price of one. So you can promote them and spread them around, hand them out to people you know. That was exactly the question. <laughs> and I, can, I can do that. Um, yes. Okay, perfect. So um, one of the questions as well, and this is something that kind of flagged for me, was about having a child, you had mentioned a children's budget within the federal budget. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how that may be used to actually also promote children's rights as well? Yeah. So uh, child rights budgeting is used to jurisdictions all around the world as a way to create accountability around what government is spending on the rights of children and uh, are we making progress or not and are kids getting their fair share? This is something that we and others have advocated for for years. Uh, in the last federal budget in 2019, we got a first um, kick at the can, the government published something called the Young Canadians Budget Booklet, uh, which mm -hmm. was um, probably a high level analysis around what the government was spending on children and youth. Um, but it was a step in the right direction. So we welcome that. Uh, but where we're continuing to advocate that they go deeper. You know, some of you may have heard of GBA plus or gender based analysis. The government has been doing really robust analysis around federal expenditures and its impact on gender. We think that that same level of depth and rigor that's being applied to gender needs to be applied to children. And so we've been working with the Minister of Finance and other key ministers and their staff to figure out how do we do that. Um, we as civil society are not just putting the onus on government, we're willing to come in and help. And so, and we brought kids to the table to meet with the Minister of Finance and other key government leaders about this and where we're mm -hmm. continuing to advocate for a deeper dive. And we'll see the next budget um, in, in, in March or early April probably. And so we'll get a, a sense of w whether the government is moving in that direction, but you can certainly count that we will continue to advocate for that um, and, and involve children directly in those discussions. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. Um, yeah, and, and for anyone who doesn't know, we are going to be seeing a new federal budget coming out with this new mandate. So I think it's March that it's... They haven't set the date for the budget yet, but it's, it would be expected probably in late March or early April. 
Perfect. So please keep your eye on that and make sure that you are engaging um, and engaging with your MPs and with the Department of Finance and the Ministry of Finance here in, in Canada. I've got a question. It's it's an interesting one. Uh, one is about the like cutting of social programs and, and how, how important oftentimes social programs really are for our children. So how do we ensure that children have access to services when we feel like those services are potentially going to be cut? Um, and, and what does that mean in terms of Canada's ranks as a world leader on poverty if we continue to cut programs that are directly impacting um, or on children's rights that are directly impacting mm -hmm. children? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, we certainly are in um, a day and age where we are seeing increasing cuts, you know, whether it's the province of Alberta, or Ontario, or many other provinces across Canada where um, children's services uh, in particular have, have, are seeing significant cuts, but also broader systems, systems around health uh, that, that obviously impact the well-being of our children and the protection of their rights. And so I, I think it's something that's really important around the child rights framework is that it obliges governments to make progress, progressive realizations. So we need to be working forward and always making more and more investments towards children rather than backwards. And so we, we um, in, in a day and age where we're seeing governments trying to make cuts, we need to be First of all, arming the, uh, using the ammunition that we have around the business case, that it costs more to do nothing or to cut back than it does to invest in the things that our children need. Um, so using, like, just being smart around the, the business case for action um, and the money that government saves by investing in, in kids today. Uh, yeah. But also, you know, busting myths around what it's like for kids in our country. It's easy to make cuts when people think that kids have got it okay, or if they've, um, uh, that they're, you know, kids in Canada are thriving. So we need to really, again, expose the myths around what it's like to grow up in our country or our city or our province. And um, and I think there's something really powerful to say about involving kids in the naming and shaming of <laughs> of, of the problems because uh, it's one thing for me as an advocate for kids um, who does this as a daily job to use these statistics and and um, and advocate for kids, but it's something else to stare into the eyes of a child who experiences these issues day in and day out. And of course, that has to be done in a, in a way that's meaningful and respectful, but. Kids themselves are very powerful advocates for changes we're seeing in the, you know, the Greta effect of children being able to hold governments accountable and um, and really pushing a sense of urgency for action. Yeah, I mean, social workers, we believe about self-determination. We also believe in children's rights. We also believe that they are experts in their own lives. So why not also include them at our policy levels as well? Mm -hmm. I, I had the fortunate, I was fortunate, I actually met Sarah at one of the events they were doing, and, and there was more children than adults. And engaging with senators, engaging with members of parliament, engaging with policymakers, engaging with me, engaging with everyone. Uh, and I have to tell you, it was, it was transformative. So if you take away a lot of things from this, it's, it's one, social workers belong at the table and the clients we serve also belong at the table as well. I'm going to wrap it up there. We are at an hour. Um, if you did have questions, you are welcome to tweet at us. You can uh, email us. Uh, you can email children first, tweet at children first. Please keep engaging with us and, and talking about these important conversations and having them in your workplaces and having them with your elected officials. Um, and obviously keeping the best interest of the child at all times. A massive, massive, massive thank you to Sarah. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for running us through this. Uh, we well, will thank you for the invitation. And I just want to say thank you to, for, for hosting this today, but I want to thank all of you who've joined from across the country. You are each in the work that you do every day, doing such a powerful um, job of serving and supporting our kids and protecting their rights. And hopefully with what you've learned today will help give you even more ammunition to be advocates for our kids. But, you know, as an advocate for kids, let alone as a parent, I just deeply value what you do for, our, for kids in our country, and I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we, social workers, you know, we work hard and, 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 and we deserve also to be to be at those policy tables and those advocates. And, and so thank you for giving us some avenues and some ways to, to do that. We are really thankful. So with that, mm -hmm. I am going to end the webcast. Thank you for joining us. We will see you next time. Please share this webcast with everyone. And, and again, thank you to Sarah and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks everybody. Have a great day.